Good evening, good day, good health, wherever you might be in the world. Uh, welcome back uh, to another episode here. And today we, we are continuing our um, topic that we started last time about Yudino Vieria. So this is technically and de facto the second part of uh, about Yudino Vieria. And as usual, I am joined by Justin, who today has a camera. Hello, Justin. Hello, Philip. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. I hope you're doing well. Thank God and yourself. I'm good. I'm good. It's 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 good. Summer is coming to an end, which is nice because it's too hot. Uh, well, we we here are in the midst of a heat advisory, so yeah, no, here it's like it will be nice to have summer come to an end. Here is like twenty degrees Celsius, but you would never understand what that means. So that that's okay. No worries. You're right, but I could tell you that the heat index here today was 102. So you know, well, not Celsius at least. <laughs> Or is it? No. <laughs> Imagine it's boiling, actually. 100 degrees is boiling. So as mentioned, uh, we will continue about uh, to talk about Idina Vieria today and next time as well. And, and before we start, we can just maybe announce that, you know, we reached out to Professor James White, uh, who wrote the book uh, Unity and Faith that we spoke about last time. And uh, he's agreed to actually come on and, and answer some questions. Uh, and, and just, you know, speak about the book and generally about the topic. I think he's, uh, you know, usually for anyone familiar with scholarly work, you probably put 50% of everything in the book. So he might have even more knowledge to share than he's written down in the book. So I thought if anyone has any questions, they might, you can just actually ask them, write them in the chat. I mean, in the, in the comment section below, and we might consider you know, in having it on, uh, asking him that. So generally just about Yudino Vieria and, and the old right in this 18th and 19th and 20th century, I think all goes, right? What do you think? I think that's a wonderful idea. <clears throat> if not, we still got hundreds of questions we could ask. So, you know, we'll be fine <laughs> regardless. So um, last time uh, we dealt with, you know, basically what, what Yudino Vieria is, uh, and we dealt with its brief, rather brief history. I mean, the, its history briefly. We dealt with the history briefly. And we stopped around the beginning of the 20th century, if I'm not mistaken. And today we will generally speak about what happened at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, you know, the revolution and all these things. But before we do that, before Justin does that largely, I thought just to go back to the topic of the previous episode. So if you haven't watched the part of one please do because it, they are very much it's i think it's necessary to watch these ones chron chronologically and and if you remember we were speaking about Idino Vieri and how in the 19th century in the 18 in the 1800s it uh, you know it grew and it and it somehow established itself but it faced a lot of opposition within the church as well within the new right church and i just thought to bring up a few very small but interesting things about this period namely that one of the reasons why Hidino Vieri and I, would, I think we could agree probably the whole old right as a, as a whole and old believers, why they struggled so much in their relationships with the so-called state church is that the state church in the beginning of the 19th century did not in any way adhere to a position that there are various rights. So in a sense, the new ritualists, the Nikonians, believed that their rituals were the only correct ones, just as the old believers believed the same. So when we had this Edinovieria situation happen at the beginning of the 19th century, when it was established legally, you had a lot of people in the church who basically said, who basically said but wait a minute, how, how is it that we can accept this, this right, this pra these practices as correct when, when they're not? So, you know, one, one Edinovieria priest told me once that... <clears throat> That the reason why he accepted the end of Vieria, because he was an old believer before, was precisely because they were all wrong, in his opinion, in the sense that both sides were adhering to the notion that their right was the only correct one. Um, so even once the end of Vieria was established, this, this became an issue. This became, an, I mean, it remained an issue within the church. Now in full community, in, in full communion, it remained an issue. And, and, um, and even, you know, in the 18th century, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church clearly declares that those who make the sign of the cross with two fingers are schismatics. So, you know, 60, 50 years after the reforms, 
they you know they reconfirmed it so 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 this whole idea of of one church two rights didn't come into fruition in the early 19th century and the indian obviously had to struggle with that right i think you you you've read about this absolutely and i think that that's one of the reasons and i had meant to comment on this yesterday so i'm glad you brought this up that i think it's pertinent that Archbishop Nikifor was the one who originally reached out to the old believers about establishing what would become the Edina Veria, because as a Greek, he had a different viewpoint on religious ritual, and the Greeks were never as dogmatic about it as the Russians, you know, because as much as we talk about old believers being dogmatic about ritual, at the time, the, you know, state church was just as dogmatic about it. Yeah. And so it, it's, you know, telling that it's a Greek who's able to say, hey, wait a second, why can't we do both? And, you know, it's, it, it kind of goes back to when you originally look at the reforms, when Patriarch Nikon wrote to the Patriarch in Constantinople about the differences, the response from Constantinople was basically, as long as it doesn't touch on matters of faith, it doesn't matter you can have a plurality of expression. And it was the fact that the Russians saw the right as being differences in right touching on differences in faith, that there was this idea that no, you could only have one right. Yeah, and I think that's very, very important to 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 point out in the whole old believer schism and, and and everything surrounding this is that both sides, you know, de facto ad adhered to the same position, just that they, you know, they they thought that their own way or the way they thought was correct is the only way. So in that sense, everything around the reforms, if you look at church history, uh, was wrong. You know, because the idea of one right is, I think, for anyone, for any serious student of church history and liturgy, it's very clear that that was never the case in the church. You know, there was always a plurality, even if that was usually based on, on geographical locations. And very rarely did we have plurality within one local church. But still, you know, it was one church with many different rights. And, and this became an issue, um, I think, for the first half of the 19th century. Um, for the Dinovierce, once they, you know, united, those old believers decided to unite with the state church and become a Dinovierce, they had to face all of this. Uh, so, you know, the whole idea of a schism within the church is, or, or, or even a church within a church is not wrong. You know, it, it's not completely wrong to, to say that that's what the Dinovierce was. Because as you, as you mentioned last time, you know, intercommunion was basically forbidden, apart from like in very, very dire situations. And, and, you know, cold celebration was forbidden, you know, old right priests wouldn't celebrate with new right priests, and so forth. So it was really like, in a sense, like a union almost, right? And this accusation, yeah, go on. Sorry, go on. I, I mean, I don't know that I personally would go that far. It, it was more, I think, in a sense, sort of a union from the standpoint of the state church where they did see this as kind of a stepping stone into the new right. And that this allowance, as I mentioned in the last episode, wasn't about, oh, you know, the old right is as salvific as the new right, but this is a condescension to bring these, you know, poor, you know, deluded schismatics in their eyes. I, I'm not saying that from myself, but back into the church. And so it was a situation where, you know, it definitely was still looked down upon. And I think you have a lot of people 
in the Russian church today who even with all of the research that has been done and the changes in views and everything, who still cling to that idea just because it's been the narrative for so long. And I mean, you have clergy and bishops who cling on to that idea, you know? You know, I, I, I know stories of, of Yudinovyerce priests in the you know, early 2000s basically being thrown out of Russian Orthodox schools almost because they are schismatics. You know, because the rector, the old priest there, you know, sees them as schismatics. So, so I mean, this is this is an ongoing process of. I think this is one of the reasons we are doing these this, this series is to you know to try to to present a, a real and legit picture of what happened. You know, not this caricature that very often is presented on both sides. I think because you know it's it's both both sides are guilty of that. So uh, it's very very interesting and. Another point I wanted to bring up that I mentioned before you took over now was, you know, the whole question of it being like a unia. And, and obviously we discussed last time how we didn't agree that that's the case. Although, for instance, in, in the 1860s, there was an old right priest, I mean, Irina Vieret in St. Petersburg, Father Johan uh, Berkovsky. Uh, you know, who gathered a lot of old believers and he wrote a petition to Alexander II and, and, and things like that, you know, on behalf of Edinoveria. And, and he actually wrote that uh, the, the, the rules of Edinoveria that we discussed briefly last time of, of Metro, Metropolitan Platon, uh, he basically called them, and this is a quote, Platon's Edinoveria is a sincere imitation of the Latin Unia, only deprived of Jesuit sof sophistry, sophistry, end quote. So, so we see 60 years after these rules are put in place, you still have priests of the Edinovieria. This is not an old believer you know, outside the church. This is a, someone in the church who is accusing these rules of being union-like. You know? and, and obviously, if he did it, then obviously the old believers did it as well as an attack. So, so what is clear is, I think, for anyone to, to, to realize the 19th century, the 1800s, was very problematic for the old white in the Russian church. It's not all beautiful. And, and I think this is what we've been trying to emphasize all the time, that you had these issues uh, all the time over and over and over again. And then at the end of the century, you have like a shift because you have, you know, you have competing sides uh, within Yedinovieri itself. So not only do you have Yedinovieri within the main church, the state church, but within Yedinovieri, you have different sides. And you will probably speak about that much more with Bishop Simon. But, you know, you had people like Filipov who all of a sudden, an old, old believer or someone affiliated with the old right within the church, you know, started to see, you know, ritual as purely ex external, you know, and even started writing that, you know, Anglicans and old Catholics, if they accepted the faith, could keep their mass, you know, and this is like the same circles, like Hidino Vierce. So, all of it, so you have this struggle in the 19th century, like, how, how do we make this work? And I think the conclusion is that at the end of, the, of this century, the, the conclusion was, I think the consensus was reached that, you know, one church, two rights is possible and probably desirable, right? Um, so, so these Absolutely. were just, yeah, but it was a struggle. It was a struggle. And like you mentioned, it still is. And, and, uh, and it's, it's a very interesting struggle to read about. Uh, it's like, it's, 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 you know, reformers, reformers, even if, if that word, you know, we don't like to use it in this context, but reformers within the Indian are just fighting amongst each other. How do we make this work? And people who are, who are in the church. So, But that's basically that, what I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about connecting it to the last episode. And I thought now, if you don't have anything else to add about the 19th century, um, the 1800s, uh, why not move on to what I think is a crucial, even if it's only 17, 18, 20 years, the 20th century, I think they're crucial for not only the church, but Irina Vieria specifically. Um, one thing I will say, just, you know, kind of as an add-on to what you said about one church, two rights, this is where even today we kind of run into problems in dialogue with a lot of old believers, because the church can say, the old right, you know, is salvific. It's equal to the new right. You can make the sign of the cross with two fingers. You can maintain nominee singing. You can do all of this. But the fact that 
it's not a wholesale return of the entire church to the old right means that it's insufficient to um, reunification in a lot of old believers minds. Yeah, because, you know, they still hold on to this idea that it has to be one right and, or, or sorry, it has to be their right, you know, the old Russian right. And, and obviously it's not, it's not strange considering, you know, they were murdered, I mean, killed and suffered simply to be able to do the two finger sign of the cross. So I think this runs deep, but as we spoke even before coming on air that, you know, it's time to heal, you know, I think that's a broader question we want to get into today, but, but yeah, definitely that's why there is no full unity between most old believers and the Orthodox church today, simply because they want the church to return completely to the old, right? Which I think anyone uh, who is serious will see is, is impossible, I think. So moving into the early 20th century, we'll touch back on some of what we said in the last episode, because we kind of started to get into this. Um, And then we'll also touch in major ways on a figure that we're hoping to do an episode devoted to him later, um, St. Simon, Shlev or St. Simon of Okta. Um, So in the early 20th century, you know, 1900 is the celebration of the centennial of the Yadina Vetsi. And we can see that, you know, because of the fact there are centennial celebrations across the empire, that this was seen as something that should be celebrated and as a good thing. Um, Professor White in his book provides quotes from two individuals at the celebrations that I'll read. Um, One is from a professor who said, Yudina Veria is also orthodoxy and the Yudina Verzi are orthodox. The same members of the United Holy Ecumenical and Apostolic Church, ritual cannot and must not serve as pretext for any division between the flocks of the United Church. So we see in this a certain direction of where things are going. There's the full recognition that these individuals are fully orthodox and that just because they serve another right, that it can't be division. But then you have um, a Bishop Peter in Perm declares at a liturgy commemorating the Yadina Verzi, as we change clothes corresponding to the time of the year, so church rituals can be changed at the discretion of the church. Rituals themselves, when not animated by faith, do not have any significance. And so even there, while he's celebrating this centenary of the Yadina Verzi, that idea of, well, you know, the church changes its rituals. Um, And so, you know, we see that there's still that kind of mixed feeling. Well, I I just want to jump in really quickly and yeah, you're right that that it's it's mixed. Uh, but I would even say you you see almost like an extreme, like going to the other side now in an extreme fashion, right? Because I I almost take his statement as being almost too much, right? Like basically saying that right is not important at all. Uh, and I right. think and I think that uh, I think almost he from an old right perspective he went too far the other way, right? Because right is still the way we express dogma, and it's been shaped by dogma, 
I mean, that's what yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. So I think like he, he's an example of like, oh yeah, like like the quote I said before. Even if Anglicans accept our faith, they can have their mass. Like, yeah. it's it's this new movement, almost like going like a reactionary movement going the other way, uh, much more extreme. So sorry for interrupting you. I just wanted to. No, no. Put it so to... you 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 have this going on, and then in 1905, something happens that. We living in the Western world, at least, if not the modern world in general, find it, it, it's difficult to understand just how monumental this is, which is that um, Tsar St. Nicholas II issues the Edict of Toleration. So we, we briefly touched on this last time with the fact that this restored full rights to old believers, that it was possible to be an old believer now and fully function in society. But at the same time, something we didn't touch on is that Prior to this point, it was a crime, sometimes even punishable by execution, to apostatize from the state church. And so it was not possible for someone who maybe was interested in old belief to go to old belief, it, it was a crime. But this edict of toleration did away with that. It now became legal for members of the state church to leave the state church. And so you'd had this sense of what was going on in the um, state church where things had become very stagnant to a large degree. And so there was this idea that if you wanted strict spiritual discipline, liturgy, etc., believers tended to look towards the old believers as sort of that ideal of where to find that. And now it was possible for those people to go to old belief. And also it was now possible for parishes and people that had become Yudina Verzi to leave the state church and return to old belief. So, so in many ways, this edict of toleration uh, was a death blow for Edinovieri. I mean, it didn't die. Um, but what happened, I think we mentioned last time as well, that many people simply joined Edinovieri so that they could be legal, so that, right. so that they could be you know, citizens, and which is tragic in itself, obviously, that they felt the need for that or that there was a need for that. But with this now that you mentioned, you know, the edict of toleration now, as you just said, you know, people were free to leave and, and some did. I think quite a lot of people actually did leave. Um, and, and this is, you know, th this, this period between uh, 1905 and the revolution, 1917, is called, you know, the golden era of old believers. Because once that edict came, they just grew, exploded. You know, they built churches, they, they opened print houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, suddenly parishes that had been taken by force by the government and by the state church, groups of old believers could petition to have those returned to the old believers from whence they were taken. And so this was, as you say, sort of, it could have been a death blow for the Adenavaria. But 
you start to have the fact that this kind of emboldens them as well. Because you have figures who are saying, wait a second, by the edict of toleration, the old believers outside of the state church are treated better than we are. You know, it, it, this doesn't, we should at least be treated as well. And so you have things that, for example, now, quote unquote, regular members of the state church can choose to become Yudina Verzi. And part of the reason for this is that if you had the serious, more spiritually disciplined minded members of the church who were going to leave for old belief by allowing them to become Yudina Verits, you stop the apostasy from the state church. Um, you then have, with this, there becomes sort of a fight, and I don't think that that's too strong a word to use, for the spirit of an identity of what the Adina Beria will be. And it's out of this that comes one of the leaders of what's called the reformed movement, the liberal movement, that in a moment, um, uh, Father Simeon Schlier. Can you please repeat that because it broke up. So just, okay, just go back to, uh, uh, you were just about to say that from this comes the leader and then it cut off. From this comes the leader, a Yudina Veritz priest, um, Father Simeon Schlier. Um, you know, and I, I'll get to him in a moment, but, you know, we, we speak of the movement that he sort of led as a reform or a liberal movement. And in a lot of cases, today we sort of think of liberal or reform as relaxing rules, um, being, you know, less serious about exactingness in the faith, et cetera. And I, I think that, you know, even looking in the um, reforms in the 17th century, we could sort of see something similar there. But in this case, that's not what's meant by reform or liberalization. Um, Instead, you know, the reform and the liberalization is looking to move from what was the status quo under the state church and in a time in which conservatism in the state church meant supporting the synodal structure, it being basically a department of the government instead of, you know, being an autonomous body that functioned completely according to the canons. And so when we talk of him being liberal and reform-minded, what we're saying is that he was pushing for that return to what had been church life. Um, and I think it's important to mention that he was not the only uh, figure pushing for some kind of changes and, and reforms. He was one of few, and, and and you know they were quite negative towards each other, right? It, it wasn't because sometimes, obviously, Saint Simon is a is a martyr, so we venerate him as a saint. And sometimes we get this idea that you know everyone followed him and 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 everything solved itself, and then the revolution came and destroyed it all, but. We could basically say that for 10 years before the revolution, there was a struggle within Yenovieria um, to, to reach the point that a reform was actually needed because people, you know, people just, 
for those that don't know, within the old believer communities, the people have a lot more say than what we was than, than what we would consider is the, the normal way today in church. You know, they would choose their own clergy. They would have a lot of say in in matters regarding their faith. And and at this time, uh, Father Simon, because he was a priest at this time, you know, he he struggled a lot uh, to get the support he needed. And and he he I think it's I just wanted to make sure we, we point that out that it wasn't somehow oh here is Father Simon Schleff, let's all follow him, right? It was really a, a struggle, a fight, a, a, a conflict. Right. And there was a quote I'm currently looking through. I felt I had highlighted it so that I would have yeah, it. I can just briefly say something while you look then that that you know, this whole crisis within the Indian obviously harkens back to the Edict of Toleration and just the strength that all believers gained. Uh, and I think you brought that up, that, that you know, they were basically better treated than the than Indian were. Uh, so I think there was like, almost like an identity crisis uh, in the Indian Oviedo, you know, what are we? What are we to be? Where is our place, you know? The old believers are now legal. Why do we exist, you know? And I think St. Simon, Father Simon, truly uh, developed and we will speak about this probably in the next episode he truly developed what Idinoveria should be you know Metropolitan Platon and his rules that it was more like a you know placeholder or whatever but yeah let's say yes to this no to that but Saint Simon truly I think showed us and demonstrated what it should be I think that's and that's what was needed because there was really a question is this even needed do we need it in Averia? I think that, that was a legit question. That that's how I read history, you know. Mm-hmm. It I I can't find the quote um, in Professor White's book, but it talks about the fact that you know the animosity between these two groups was such that by the time it came to the congresses that happened earlier in the 20th century, that it was impossible, it, it was almost impossible to get the two sides in. Together. And so, you know, we, we, we speak about St. Simon a lot, not just because, you know, of the fact that he's a saint, but also the fact that to a certain degree, you can sort of say that his party, for lack of a better term, won in the war over what the identity of the Adina Varia would be. Um, And so we come with this. So here's a quote that Dr. White provides in his book that gives an image of what this looked like at this point. And this was in the early 20th century. It doesn't have an exact year. well, in looking, I lost the quote again. Okay. Um, Eudena Varia suffers from its fragmentation. It is scattered all over Russia. And so part of the problem was that Eudena Varia had no organization above the parish level. Um, and with the Edict of Toleration, various old believer concords were able to start setting up larger structures. Um, the Belaya Krinitsa hierarchy was able to really solidify and centralize. Um, some of the priest list concords you know, came together, they would start holding, you know, national conferences 
and as you pointed out, you know, they developed printing houses and all of this. And this was something that at least at the moment, the Udina Verci didn't have. Um, it didn't have a singular source of authority, as Dr. White puts it, over all its parishes and monasteries. And so what Father Simeon was trying to do was to work out a plan for how this could, you know, be a higher level institution and higher level centralized structure, which did lead to, as you mentioned before, this idea of it being a church within a church. Um, but so, you know, he, part of what the central point of this was, is the idea of having a Yudina Varia bishop. Um, and this had been requested from the emperor before and had always been denied. And so at least by this point, the Senate was willing to say, you know, yes, we will, we, we agree that a bishop for the Adina Verzi is a good idea, but we do not think at this time that there's a single candidate who stands out. Um, and you had, you know, hierarchs that if we're familiar with Russian church history, we, we know some of the names, um, most especially Metropolitan Antony Krepovitsky, who actually offers to the Synod to become the Yudina Verzi Bishop. Um, but the Synod declines. And I just want to jump in really quickly. Yeah. Why? Why they were negative towards that? I think that's important to, to mention because that's the argument that is still held by them today. Mm -hmm. Even if you will get, of course, to the point that they eventually got bishops, uh, the argument that is used against it today was the same that was used before they eventually got it in 1917-18. And I think that's the fact that, first and foremost, it's not canonical, according to Orthodox canons, to have two bishops in one city. And if you create, uh, if you make a bishop over a group of people that are spread out over the whole country, you end up in a situation where you know, the local bishop has nothing to say about a flock that is in his territory. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, 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 first, the first objection was based on that, I think. And the second one uh, was obviously, maybe not obviously, but the second one was simply that they were afraid that if they made a bishop, he could leave to the schism and that would give the old believers a validly ordained bishop. Mm -hmm. So we have the canonical uh, objection and the more, you know, we don't trust these people because they're all ritualist objection, right? And that's the, and we have to point out again and again, there was a lot of mistrust between the, the hierarchs and the Edinovirts. You know, are these people schismatics? Are they not? Do they like us? Do they not? Like, will they leave? Will they not? And, and it, it continues, it continued, sorry, up until the well, exhibition. And, you know, this, this jumps forward a little bit, but it's an interesting, situation from hagiography that I, I would love to look more into, but again, my Russian is poor, so I can't look at the sources where this would really be addressed. So um, if any of our listeners have any information about this, I would love to know. Um, there's actually another um, old ritualist bishop, he's not the first, of course, but um, St. Andre Uktomsky, I think, I may be wrong there, um, but St. Andre 
who is consecrated a bishop and as an effort of hitting the, um, or bringing in old believers was actually given a blessing by Patriarch St. Tikhon to join together to an old believer synod in an attempt to bring them in, which unfortunately didn't, fa didn't succeed. Um, but you, so you do have instances where that, you know, happens. Um, but so I, I think really, you know, to continue going into more detail here, um, we would be talking a lot specifically about St. Simon. And if we're going to be doing an episode on him, maybe this is kind of a good place to stop and unless you have any more to add and then say more about his specific reforms and him individually um, for a later episode. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think we can we can spend a little time now just discussing what you know what what you spoke about now, and then we could. I think surely that that it's very interesting to to, to give him a whole episode, uh, because I'm afraid that it would be too long if you want to include it now. Uh, people will fall asleep. Maybe. <laughs> I hope that. I hope it's interesting. It's 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 very interesting. You know, the beginning of the 20th century in Russia, generally speaking. Uh, I think anyone should study that those 17 years because they're very very interesting and 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 especially after 1905 there was a lot of shifts and and in many ways if we just now speak freely and jump freely in timelines this whole problem before um the revolution before the synod the council of 1917 is in many ways still alive today for the edina vierce uh, and even though they're like a thousand times smaller than they were before the revolution or even a million times smaller, I, I know I'm not good at math. They're tiny now compared to then. It's the same somehow problem of should we have a bishop? Should we not? Who should govern us? It's still alive in the Russian church. Obviously now there's commissions that are trying to solve this. Um, uh, but as commissions often do, they meet and uh, you know not a lot is happening, sadly. But uh, truly, the, the time before the 1917 council was a tumultuous one, not only in the church, but especially, but uh, but uh, within the Vierce in particular. And and I would really love for us to go deeper into the you know the very the various factions and the various standpoints, and probably we'll do that more when we speak only about Saint Simon. Uh, but again, I can't recommend enough. Uh, to all of you to read um, uh, Professor White's book because he really goes into detail and he presents all the sides and the various somehow uh, outcomes that would have happened if those various sides won, quote unquote, because as you said, it was really like a battle, right? It was, it was really, really like a battle. <clears throat> and the, the, the question of bishops within the old right, within the Nevada, again, it's alive all the time. So, so, so it's, it's, I think it's good we touch upon it because I've even seen English language Orthodox sites, you know, post articles about this, you know, that, oh, Metropolitan Hilarion Afeev will be old right bishop of the Edina Vierte, you know. So I think it's good, it's good that we bring it up and, and speak about it in depth next time. And for those who, who wonder about St. Simon, he was a married priest. Uh, at first, he was well, he was highly edu educated. We'll speak about that in detail more. So, in many sense, he was he was um, not someone you would maybe traditionally associate with old ritualism. And I'm not saying that because they're not educated, but usually in these times, you know, old, old believers they wouldn't somehow go to state schools. You know, they wouldn't go to universities in in the same extent. So he was unique in that way. And I think that's why the next episode will be interesting because we will be able to understand his his quest, his his ideas much, much better. So do you have more you would like to add? I think I've talked enough today. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, I think we've gone. I think on. everyone else probably agrees too. So. No, no, it's, it's. I mean, listen. Sometimes we have to speak. You know, sometimes there is a topic. But just to summarize it all, nineteen five set off a chain of events <clears throat> that you know, without going into politics, just staying in church, that really forced. I think it forced Moscow Patriarchate at that time after they reestablished the Patriarchate to give them a bishop, the University of Bishop. Uh, and this and the, this bishop who was Saint Simon, we will discuss discuss more in depth uh, later. So I, I feel that's that's not all enough for today. If you would agree, I agree entirely. Yeah. So 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 we will we will continue doing the series. And I, at first I said two free episodes, but you know right now I think we could do one about Saint Simon. We will do one with, with Professor White. We can do one about modern or ritualists in the church. So already we have five, five, six. So this could be good. This could be good. So uh, thank you all for uh, listening, watching. And this is available on YouTube and also now on all big podcast uh, sites, networks, however you say in English. You just search Old Believer series. It's all under one umbrella. Even if on YouTube we call this Idino Vieria, but it's all under the Old Believer series if you look for podcasts. So, so if you want audio only, just, just go there and Spotify and iTunes and all of these things. So I think that's good because I, I think many people prefer to just listen, not watch. There's not much, there's not much to watch. I, I, I really want to improve my editing skills and add pictures, but, but then we will we'll have a video every two years. <laughs> so, okay, thank you, Justin, for, for joining me. And thank you all for and thank you all for for listening. And uh, we'll see you and speak to you very soon again with uh, where we will focus on Saint Simon. Thank you all and goodbye. God bless.